Summer, sunshine, blue skies. Welcome to the warmest season of the year. It's not much of a holiday for nature, though. On the contrary, everything roars into top gear. Parents have to get their offspring ready for an independent life. Insects multiply en masse, swarming over fields and forests in their millions. And plants go all out to get their seeds and fruits ripe. But summer isn't all just sweetness and light. The unbridled forces of nature are also unleashed. In the long days of summer. In many places, summer kicks off in bright yellow. Fields of lush dandelions mark the end of spring. Especially for bees, these flowers provide a rich pasture until early June. These robust wild herbs are a food source for cattle too. After eating, cows must ruminate several times so that the grass and flowers they've consumed can be turned into milk. Storks returned here back in early spring. Now, during the warm season, they're busy raising their young. They actually seek out living space close to human beings. Perched on rooftops, they're safe from most of their enemies. And it's much easier for them to find food in freshly mown meadows than in high wild grass. On the other hand, the fox avoids human habitation. And for good reason, foxes are hunted everywhere. Fox pups remain in their hidden den during their first few weeks. Mother and father take it in turns to bring them food. At the start of summer, the fox pups are big enough for their first outings. They have to explore their surroundings and learn where and how to find food. Of course, play is an important part of childhood, but these rough and tumbles also help the little ones practice important skills they will need later for survival, stalking, leaping, and fighting. A big deer is hardly suitable quarry for either the young foxes or their parents. A fawn is more likely to be in danger but it's not easy to spot. It can hide itself very effectively in the high grass. And only a few weeks after it's born, the fawn follows its mother everywhere. Most dandelions are ready to seed by June. The slightest breeze is enough to carry their seeds far and wide. Hopefully somewhere where they'll land on fertile soil so that the next generation of dandelions can grow. In early summer, the meadows become a rather less harmonious place for the animal world. It's time for the first mowing. The mown grass provides rich, fresh fodder for barn-held livestock. The meadows grow back quickly, blooming and maturing in a very short time. 
but insects also spread rapidly, especially aphids. Winged and wingless. Also known as plant lice, an aphid can bear several nymphs a day. Plant juice is what they live off. However, aphids only need part of the nutrients, and once digested, there's plenty of sugar and water left over. And this sweet syrup, called honeydew, attracts the ants. They gather the aphids' secretions to feed the young in their own nest. In return, they protect the aphids from predators. But the ants aren't always there in time to guard their charges. Once the ladybirds show up, the aphids are in for a rough time. Each pretty little beetle can consume up to 50 of the pests a day. But the biggest danger for these creepy crawlies is posed by birds. They're out hunting bugs by the thousands for their hungry offspring. Summer is a hectic time for parent birds. Like the blue tit, they're all on a constant search for food. Plant lice, caterpillars and beetles are top of the list now, as their chicks need protein in order to grow. They need parental care even after they've left the nest and can fly. And while the young scatter in the branches, their parents fly hither and thither, battling to keep them all fed. Between feeding sessions, the young birds scout their immediate surroundings for anything edible. Soon they will have to catch beetles and caterpillars themselves. The beginning of summer is high season for the codling moth, a pest that attacks ripening fruit after the apple tree has blossomed. A juicy codling moth caterpillar would make a tasty snack But the young blue tit lacks experience. It has yet to develop the right beak skills. It won't be able to survive like that on its own, but mum and dad are still around to help out. In the duck world, things are quite different. The ducklings are precocial, leaving their nests immediately upon hatching to look for their own food. Catching flies mid-air is apparently an inborn talent for ducks. Once they've eaten enough plant and insect food in the meadow, the mother duck leads them to the lake. This is where these waterfowl are in their real element. Even though they still only have downy feathers, the little ones are already experts at swimming and diving. They eat plants, larvae, worms, and all kinds of water creatures. The lake offers them an abundant choice. The great crested grebes chicks are actually also able to swim and dive immediately after hatching. But during the first three weeks, they prefer to travel on their parents' backs. A nice, safe place to wait for their next meal. No sooner is the fish caught than the parental houseboat hurries to its mate carrying the hungry passenger. It seems nothing is more important than feeding their chick.
that's the parents' main job during the summer. In June, the days are filled with 15 hours of energy-laden sunshine. The plants take full advantage of it and grow for all they're worth. For the female squirrel, the long days mean more time to forage for food. Her young have already grown quite big and will soon be following her on her expeditions through the branches. On her exploratory forays, the mother finds fresh buds, berries and fruits to eat, or even young birds. She needs a highly nutritious diet as her young are still dependent on her. On the ground, sweet, wild strawberries are ripening. They're a popular treat for the forest animals. The plants like the semi-shady spots under the trees and bear their juicy fruits all summer long. This berry is actually a nut, or more accurately, an aggregate fruit. The little nuts on the outside are hard and are excreted by the animals that eat them spreading them right across the forest. Ants like sweet things too. Not only aphid honeydew, but also the flesh of the wild strawberry, so they also help to distribute its seeds. But red ants are hardly peace-loving vegetarians. To rear their larvae, they also need protein. That means caterpillars, beetles, and other insects have to watch out. This dung beetle hasn't a chance against the army of ants. Their onslaught with powerful jaws and acid sprays simply overwhelms it. Soon, it will be just another food source for the brood of this multi-million sized ant colony. Summer is high season in the ant nest. Their offspring's nutritional requirements are enormous. A single colony collects some 30 kilograms of insects and 200 liters of honeydew from the surrounding area every year. This is their peak harvest time, as the ant colony rests in winter. Elm tree seeds are already ripe in early summer. Nutritious food for this female squirrel. She only has one offspring and must now introduce it to the world, demonstrating how best to survive in it. The little one is almost fully grown and will soon be fending for itself. It has already learned the essential acrobatics needed for foraging and has a physique that is perfectly suited to the job. Light, quick and extremely agile, it can reach tasty seeds on even the outermost twigs and branches. Hardly surprising that squirrels live much of their lives in the treetops. In contrast, lakes and ponds form the focal point of life for a wide variety of insects and microorganisms. Dragonflies, for example, need calm waters to breed. Here, they produce one generation after another. These azure damsel flies have just hatched and now have around four weeks in which to mate.
The process begins by the male grabbing the female by the neck. She then bends her abdomen downwards and forwards and picks up the sperm packet at the front of the male's abdomen. Both of them have to stay on the lookout as not every damselfly has found its own partner. And the so-called love wheel often has would-be intruders trying to break it up. Other males also want to pass on their genes, but a mating couple already locked together is not that easy to pry apart. The victorious male holds on to his female partner until she has deposited her eggs, ensuring that no one else can interfere. An aquatic plant just below the lake's surface is the perfect place for damselflies to lay their eggs. At the end of its abdomen, the female has an ovipositor, a spiky shaft with which she stabs the plant stems and pushes the eggs into them. In just a few weeks, larvae will hatch from these eggs, and next year, they will metamorphose into damselflies. Everywhere else in the insect world, too, the main priority now is to create as many offspring as possible. The meadows are positively teeming with mating insects. June is the high point of summer. An unmistakable sign of this is the field poppy. It's one of the most proliferous producers of pollen and a magnet for insects of all kinds. Next to bees, hoverflies are the most important pollinators. Since the Stone Age, the poppy has been a typical companion plant to grains. Today, however, the poppy is considered a weed in grain fields, as are many other wildflowers that grow on farmland. Most animals make full use of the long summer days. But the dormouse has a different rhythm. While it's light, it would rather stay in its nest. There, it will sleep all day long. For eight months, from October till May, it hibernates. It's only active for four months during summer. But not when the sun is high in the sky. On the other hand, hares are out and about all year long. Now and again, their territories overlap with those of the rabbits. Seen next to each other, they're easy to tell apart. Rabbits are small and rounder. Hares are bigger and have much longer ears. Hares are loners, living in the open fields and only get together during the mating season. Rabbits, on the other hand, are sociable animals, forming what can become very large colonies and building huge burrows. Both species generally only venture forth to forage for food at twilight and, especially in summer, will spend all night munching away.
badgers also only spring into action at dusk. The almost fully grown young are exploring their world. Their playground is the edge of the forest, where they can easily find cover to hide. The mother badger, meanwhile, does housekeeping. To keep the set comfortable, she collects leaves and carries them into the extensive underground hollow. After all, it's where the family spends most of its time. Hardly any animal lives a more concealed life than the badger. The nights are short in summer. For nocturnal animals, this means there's not much time for foraging. The dormouse spends these brief hours hunting among the branches for insects, fruits, and nuts. In summer, many animals take advantage of the cool early morning hours. The magpie already starts hunting for food before dawn. And it gets lucky. A carcass is a very convenient find. But it has to watch out because this is not its own prey. It actually belongs to the young foxes. They aren't really hungry anymore, but don't want just to give up the catch that their parents brought them. So they're keeping a sharp eye on the magpie. A cat and mouse game ensues. Until eventually, the little fox cubs lose interest and the magpie can finally eat its fill. Stinging nettles are not generally very popular, but they are important forage plants for butterfly caterpillars. The caterpillars of the peacock butterfly are even exclusively dependent on the nettle plants. The small tortoise shell that hatches out of this caterpillar can't do without nettles either. Caterpillars are impervious to the stinging hairs of the plants and can devour them with virtually no competition. For about four weeks, they eat constantly. Then, the caterpillar attaches itself to a sheltered spot and pupates, well protected by the nettle from its predators. Now, a butterfly gestates inside the pupa. Both the small tortoise shell and the peacock butterfly take around two to three weeks to emerge from their pupae. And it only takes about 10 minutes for them to free themselves from the sheath. Now the soft wings have to be pumped up. Only then is the butterfly ready to go looking in the fields for nectar and a mating partner. Flower-filled meadows are populated by a host of different species. From the small tortoise shell, to the ringlet, and common yellow swallowtail, 
It's an excellent habitat for them all. Summertime is high season for butterflies, and also, of course, for all kinds of insects, beetles and spiders. Not all field dwellers are interested in nectar and pollen. A crab spider uses a daisy flower as its hunting ground. Its ingenious hunting method can be fatal for its prey. It waits motionless for its victim. But it doesn't always succeed. Now, all it can do is wait some more. Failed attempts are part of its daily routine, so the crab spider retreats for a while. It's very well camouflaged, being able to adapt the colour of its body to the environment. And it continues to lurk, unnoticed. Until finally, it has a successful catch. Blossoming is over for the fruit trees. Now it's time for the fruit. Cherries are among the earliest additions to the menu for many fruit lovers. Among them, and especially keen, is the starling. Feeding their insatiable offspring is easier directly at the food source. A flock of starlings with their young can decimate an entire cherry harvest in no time at all. But armed only with a beak, it isn't easy to divide a cherry into bite-sized pieces. And they can't be swallowed all in one go. Amid all the bounty, things can go wrong. But in nature, nothing goes to waste. A cherry like this will always find grateful takers on the ground below. Mice love the sweet, juicy fruit. The starling has evidently had enough of its parental duties. It's time for the chicks to fend for themselves. The summer heat gets more and more intense, even in the shade of the trees. In the hornet colony, they're feeling the heat noticeably. The guards at the entrance of the nest now have an additional duty. They use their wings as fans, fanning cool air into the nest. Flies don't belong to the hornet colony.
the same as everywhere else, they're not wanted around here. And even a guard hornet can't get on with its job properly when irritating flies are buzzing about. The hotter it gets, the more important the water resources become. Insects also have a greater need for water when temperatures soar. Bees don't only drink to quench their thirst, they fill up on water so they can help cool down the hive at home. They're all thirsty now, even the sparrows. They know exactly where to find water, and when it gets very hot, they will often fly long distances for a cool drink. Just like bees, the wasps also use water to cool their nests. They suck up as much water as their abdomen will hold. are also interested in more than just drinking the water. It helps them to cool down. And they can clean their feathers while splashing about too. Sand baths are also a great favorite. Rubbing themselves in the sand gets rid of parasites and removes stubborn dirt. Sparrows are sociable birds, preferring to nest in groups. A stork's nest is an ideal location. Here, they're well protected and their nests are in the shade. The perfect spot for a sparrow family. For young storks, however, the heat can be dangerous. Their nests are exposed to the merciless glare of the sun. The parent birds must provide shade, or else their young could die. But shade alone isn't enough. The young storks are also thirsty. In the hot weather, the parent birds carry water back to the nest in their crops. Much needed refreshment for the troubled chicks. Almost all the animals are now suffering under the scorching sun. Even the cows retreat to the shade. And drinking has become almost more important than eating.
A fully grown cow usually needs around 100 litres of water a day, but in the heat, it can be much more. All through the summer, mosquitoes and gnats breed in shallow or stagnant water. The larvae generally hang by their respiratory tubes from the water's surface and filter plant particles from the water with their mouth parts. After a few weeks, they change their habitat and leave their subaquatic world. It takes around half an hour for the insect's body to free itself from the pupa. In point of fact, the mosquito is a miracle of nature. It's just a pity that they hatch in their millions and become a plague. But they're not the only ones. There's a myriad biting, stinging and blood-sucking insects swarming about in the air. Much to the delight of the swallows, who catch the insects in flight. For most other animals, however, the swarms of mosquitoes are extremely annoying. But when the clouds gather in the skies and the wind picks up, the mosquito plague is over. A typical summer thunderstorm is brewing. Charged up and electrified by the heat, the air discharges in pure energy. For nature, parched and thirsting, the rain is a blessing. Animals also relish the cooling rain. Cows can now eat and drink at the same time. The earth in the meadows has softened up and the storks are hunting for worms. The cool moisture gives the plant and animal kingdoms respite from the stressful heat. In the forest, the trees gratefully absorb the rain. They also suffer in the heat, and in extreme cases can even begin to drop their leaves.
but for now, they can continue to provide shade with their dense leaf canopy. The young squirrels are learning to be independent. They're practicing their climbing skills as they play. But they still have to deal with the serious business of life. And above all, that means finding food. There's usually no shortage of spruce cones. But these little forest imps have many enemies. Have they learned enough from their mother to be able to survive on their own? A nap high up in the treetop seems safe enough. But on the ground, watchfulness is essential. From their ear tufts to the tip of their tails, the squirrel's body is ideally designed for life in the forest. A vital prerequisite for survival in their adult life. Since the first fresh greenery appeared, the deer have been eating their fill. They have long since made up for their weight loss during winter and are now building up their reserves. They will need them too, because their mating season, or rut, already starts in July. 67 days after the birth of their kids, the does are fertile again. But he first has to discover whether or not she's ready yet. Evidently, her scent is attracting him, so he stays close to her. This so-called herding behavior can take hours or even days and uses up a lot of energy. There's not much time left for feeding. The hay harvest in late summer mainly serves to provide stores for the farmer. For storks, it means much easier hunting conditions. Storks are a protected species, but it's still not often that a tractor will give a stork right away. When the meadow is freshly mown, the storks gather up the dead insects. Earthworms are easier to find now, but the birds typically go for bigger morsels. Mice are the storks' main prey, especially when they're rearing their young. And hunting them behind a tractor is definitely easier than in the high grass. The nest-bound young are constantly hungry. A stork needs around 15 mice a day to be fully fed, and the young are still growing. At the end of July, the young birds are nearly fully fledged. They won't be staying with their parents for much longer. As soon as the migration southward begins in August, they will be on their own.
the dear couple is still together. He stays near her until she makes the first move. Is this a good sign that she approaches him so closely? Yes, it is. The buck clearly interprets it as a call to action. She's only fertile for a short while, and he can't afford to miss the moment. Finally, it's time. After mating, the fertilized egg will stay in the roe deer's womb, only beginning to develop further in December or later. The following May or June, the roe will give birth to new offspring. The grain ripens quickly in the summer heat. And if the weather conditions are not too dry, there's a good chance of a rich harvest. The end of summer is harvest time everywhere. The young have left home and the animals can now take care of themselves. The ripe ears of wheat have a magical attraction for songbirds. Flocks of sparrows arrive. For them, the nutritious grains are a concentrated food source. While they were rearing their chicks, they mainly fed on insects. But the breeding season is over, and the last of their brood are now independent. So, now that the grain has ripened, it's time for a change in diet. Soon, the glut will disappear. Sunflowers bloom towards the end of the warm season. Their large flower heads are now one of the most important food sources for insects. For butterflies, bees and bumblebees, sunflowers offer the last flower pastures of the summer. Trees bend under the weight of fruits that have absorbed every available ray of sunshine to ripen. They herald the next stage in the eternal cycle of the seasons. Because now, summer is over. Summer is over.